I want to focus on West Antarctica. They've measured disturbing changes on the underside of this ice sheet. So let's go. Ah, hmm, problem. The disturbing changes seem to have been caused by thickening ice. Gore Era 17. The citizens of these Pacific nations, this one is Tuvalu, the Maldives, you know them all, Carteret Islands, um, all had to evacuate to New Zealand. None of these nations has evacuated to New Zealand. I've checked with the New Zealand High Commission. It's just not true. And here... Sea level rise, what sea level rises? Kandakar 2005, Johnston Island, no sea level rise for 50 years, down to Saipan, none for 22 years. No sea level rises. Onwards, Maldives, Myrna et al. Now, Niels Axel Myrna knows more about sea level than anyone else in the world. He's studied it for 30 years continuously. And no trend, basically. You know, it's been higher before. It's, it's about at, at its mean over the last 1,200 years now. No problem. Besides, corals can grow at 10 times the rate that sea level is even predicted to rise. So there's no reason why any of these islands should disappear and no need for any of the citizens to go to New Zealand or anywhere else. Next slide. Ah, yes, mosquitoes. There are cities that were founded because they were just above the mosquito line. Nairobi is one. Nairobi was not founded because it was above the mosquito line. It was founded because it was a pre-existing Kikuyu watering hole on the Kikuyu escarpment on the railway known as the Lunatics Line between Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. That was why Nairobi was built where it was and there have been at least ten major outbreaks of malaria in Nairobi between its foundation and today in one of which a long time ago the mosquitoes spread as far up as El Doret which is nearly 10,000 feet above sea level and about three times the height of Nairobi. So all of that stuff from Gore's film is simply arrant nonsense. Here is what has actually happened. We've had, um, between 1880 and 1945, here are um, malaria outbreaks at high altitudes, but in the period when most of the supposed global warming caused by us has happened, this is recent, that's from 1945 onwards, uh, you can see the altitude there, they're all much lower down rather a graphic demonstration that there is no appreciable increase in the height at which malaria goes. Why? The biggest malaria outbreak in the world was in the 1920s and 30s in that hot spot of the climate known as Siberia. 600,000 people were killed, 30,000 of them as far north as Arkhangelsk on the Arctic Circle. And the only connection between malaria and climate is that the malaria mosquito requires a temperature of at least 15 degrees Celsius during its relatively short breeding season, but can otherwise survive very comfortably. Thank you. It's nothing whatever to do with global warming. Next slide. Now this is the biggie. This is the one that everybody gets most scared about. The city of Santa Barbara has decided to paint a line through the entire county showing where the 20-foot level rise would come when sea level, which it imminently expects to rise, will reach that level. Why does it think that? Because Al Gore has said so. This Saint Albert has pronounced. And behold, sea level will rise 20 feet. Oh dear, no it won't. Because the second assessment report says maybe three feet. Third assessment report, two feet eleven. Fourth assessment report, one foot ten. But maybe if we have a more realistic um, level of population, one foot five. So there's the worst exaggeration uh, in the film and arguably the worst and most serious in this entire debate. I could have shown you, we haven't time, another 14 or 15 errors, equally bad. But that is how astonishingly inaccurate this particular film is. Now, here's one of the problems. Whatever damage we might have been conceived to have done to the climate by putting CO2 in it, China is now the one to watch. If Britain were to shut down completely, turn off all the lights, and have no trains, planes, aeroplanes, hospitals, industries, nothing, then the total emissions that we would therefore not be putting out would be made up by just the increase in Chinese emissions in less than two years. Apply that to the whole of Europe and the United States and Canada and you're looking at China and India between them making up the difference just in the growth of their emissions within perhaps 10 to 15 years even if we were to shut down altogether the whole of the Western economies. That's not going to make any difference, let alone a sufficient difference. Let's move on. And here we come to what I think is the most tragic aspect of this whole debate. Here you have child mortality up to the age of five per thousand persons born, again versus CO2 emissions along the bottom, and here the more the CO2 emissions, the fewer 
the deaths you get of children before the age of five. Once again, poor old Africa right up there. Look at that, Sierra Leone, 285 people per thousand dying if their children are under five, compared with 7.7 per thousand in Iceland. And CO2, the correlation there, again, you might say it doesn't imply causation, but there are reasons why it should. And if, therefore, you say to the third world, no, you can't have the carbon emissions we've already had that have made us prosperous, that have reduced our mortality rates, then you are condemning them to die in their tens of millions. And I do not think that is something which this House ought to find acceptable. Let's move along and see the problem in a different light. Here, the world population is... Um, growing very rapidly, not particularly rapidly, in the prosperous countries because, and this is the paradox of population, it's the level of prosperity which determines your rate of increase in population. The more prosperous you are, paradoxically, the less fast you will reproduce. There are many economic, social and medical reasons why this should be so. If we say to third world countries, you are going to have to deny yourselves carbon emissions, the likely effect of that, demographically speaking, is going to be that they will increase their population, or at the very least fail to reduce it towards stability, which they would be able to do if they were allowed the prosperity, which is very closely correlated with fossil fuel consumption. We could be advocating policies that will actually increase not only the poverty in these countries, but the environmental disaster that poverty produces of overpopulation and hence depletion of resources and incredible damage to the environment and of course if there are lots more people however where you stack it there's going to be a larger carbon footprint whether you like it or not. Well now there are two other considerations we need to look at, one other major one and that is shouldn't we take precautions just in case the scientists are right that are trying to push this alarmist notion. The murderous I've called it precautionary principle, it's not a principle at all it's an expedient used by in the environmentalist lobby to justify schemes which, without a slogan of that kind, would be seen for what they are, which is barking mad and incredibly cruel. Now, I'm going to look at two previous worldwide scares, both of them quite recent. One was a real scare, one was a bogus scare. Both of them, the policies were got disastrously wrong because of the effect of pressure groups and the result was that in each case, millions died. Here we go. HIV. Now, 20 years ago, I had just come out of number 10. I went across to the US Army Medical Research Division, who had done the first detailed researches on AIDS. I said, my cabinet needs to know what this is going to do and what we should do about it. And the guy in charge of the research almost in tears, said, oh my God, how nice that somebody is asking rather than telling me. He said, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to make sure that we test everyone to find out who's got it, and we isolate, in the kindliest way possible, those who have got it. That is the standard procedure with any fatal infectious transmissible disease. That's what you do. And I said, well, you know, that's rather difficult, isn't it, socially? We've got campaigning groups saying we mustn't do that. He said, yes, we have. But if they prevail, tens, perhaps hundreds of millions will die. And he said, I beg of you, use your voice, go and write and say we must do this, because it will help us internally to argue this case, which we're not winning at the moment. So I wrote, first in the US and then in the UK. I was subjected as a result of those articles to some of the most intense personal vituperation and vilification that I've ever received in a long and sometimes controversial career. I was the subject of hate mail, phone calls, threats, death threats, the lot. Because I suggested that people who got AIDS ought to be isolated so that people who hadn't got it wouldn't get it. This was regarded as totally unacceptable and cruel and vicious and etc. And it was heartbreaking, and I mean heartbreaking, what then happened. Let's move on. Since I wrote those articles and I failed, I failed to persuade people to do the right thing, 25 million people died worldwide, 40 million now are infected, 7.5% infected south of the Sahara, 0.7% infected in the United States. And now, a warning to the United States and eventually to us, 1% is the epidemic threshold. Once 1% prevalence is achieved in the United States, nobody's talking about this over there. Then you can't stop it spreading right through the population as it has in Africa. That's what happens. 
It'll be a bit slower than in Africa for various factors, but it will still spread. It will kill millions, even 